Latin America, Africa, Iraq, and North Korea. He served as a United States Congressman for 15 years, representing the 3rd Congressional District in Northern New Mexico. While a Congressman, Governor Richardson served as a Special Envoy on many sensitive international missions. He successfully won the release of hostages, American servicemen, and prisoners in North Korea, Iraq, Cuba, and Sudan. During the Clinton administration, he served as the United States Ambassador to the United Nations and Energy Secretary. As Governor of New Mexico from 2003 until 2011, Governor Richardson tackled the issues of education, environmental responsibility, clean renewable energy, and health care. He also ran for the Democratic nomination for president in 2008. In 2011, Governor Richardson established the Richardson Center for Global Engagement, where he uses negotiation skills to promote global peace and citizen diplomacy. He has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 1995, 1997, 2000, and 2001, and continues to be one of the most respected and prominent voices in the diplomatic world today. Tonight, he will discuss his new book, How to Sweet Talk a Shark, Strategies and Stories from a Master Negotiator, published in the fall of 2013. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Governor Bill Richardson. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. I noticed that he spent very little time on my presidential race, <laughs> which, as you know, ended uh, after New Hampshire. And, uh, you know, first I want to thank the Institute. I mean, this is where presidential campaigns start. I, I remember being here when I was first running. And uh, I just recall the, the wondrous experience it was campaigning in New Hampshire. I, I really mean this. Uh, I, I, I felt, you know, as I drive through the mountains and the greenery and, and the people, that, that I was like in heaven. Uh, you know, I, w I just did an event for the state Democratic Party, and someone said to me, you know, uh, you know, Governor, uh, New Hampshireites really loved you. They just didn't vote for you. <laughs> but, you know, I, uh, first of all, I want to thank the seven people that did vote for me that are here in the audience. <laughs> thank you so much. I also want to recognize some friends. You know, you get in trouble when you don't do that. You get into more trouble when, when you forget the... Those, uh, of course, uh, Neil Levesque, uh, who invited me, and Anne, I don't know where she is, but she did all the logistics. She sent a private jet that you all paid for to pick me up. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but I, I see old McKenna there, and, and so many of you that helped me. I want to recognize Senator Lou D'Alessandro, who's here. You know, anybody running for president, you got to go see Lou, and he's got to bless you. Uh, and, and his family. It's great to see him. Uh, Ambassador George Bruno, God bless him. Uh, you know, he was he, great courage when he endorsed me. He was one of the seven. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. George, you've served this country so well. Now helping uh, immigration reform. Uh, Jim Demers, the Obama campaign co uh, coordinator. Very nice to see you. You stayed young. What do you do? Do you... <laughs> Uh, you, you all look so good. I want to um, just again um, tell you that um, the book that I've written, it's called How to Sweet Talk a Shark. Now, why is it relevant to not just politics, but to you? Um, Rodale, 1875. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, that's supposed to be funny. Like, uh, Rodale is my publisher. But the reason I, I, I mention it is what I try to do in these negotiations that I've had uh, in my diplomatic career and my political career, uh, whenever there was a problem with North Korea, Cuba, Sudan, with the world's worst dictators, uh, President Clinton would send me to try to negotiate either a prisoner release or a ceasefire. And the press used to ask him, well, why do you send Richardson? He'd say, bad people like him, that's why. <laughs> and so I'd end up in, in North Korea or in the, with the Taliban, with Cuba, uh, with Hugo Chavez, and, and in the book I detail those negotiations. I try to talk about the successful negotiations, 
but also about the mistakes I made. I know the Institute of Politics, we got some students here. Things to avoid when you're negotiating. So I'll go into some of the goods and the bads. Um, in addition to that, there's a chapter on something that I'm most remembered for in the presidential campaign. It wasn't my entry, uh, it wasn't my exit, but it was my endorsement of Barack Obama over Hillary Clinton after having worked with the Clintons. And how I see that as, as an important announcement, but involving some mistakes that I made in doing that. So I'll get into that, but at the same time, um, talk about one thing that my last two weeks as governor of New Mexico, and it was a fundamental issue, one of the most important issues in the Southwest and in the history of New Mexico. Should I pardon Billy the Kid or not? <laughs> it was not a very important decision, but it was, you know, it did capture the fancy and how in the end I decided not to, but what were the circumstances uh, involving that? Again, uh, my thanks to everybody for being here. Um, I used to tell, uh, I do some of these events with Governor Tim Pawlenty of Minnesota, who uh, likes to tell people that his presidential run was shorter than a Kardashian wedding. <laughs> I, wish, I wish I'd thought of that line, but I did last, I did last a, a couple of primaries. And you know, recently, uh, my friend is uh, Joe Biden, who's, you know what he's doing now. And, and I, I tell people, I tell him, I said, well, you know, Joe, I got more votes than you did in Iowa and New Hampshire. And he says, yeah, but I'm vice president. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, what, what I'm gonna talk about is what are the kinds of negotiations that involve some of the principles that I use in negotiating. And, and the reason that I wrote this book is because what the publisher wanted me to do was try to transform political negotiations into everyday life. He said, you know, what I'd like in this book is for the average person, when they negotiate with their spouse or their partner or their mother or father, or you know, a bad marriage, or when you're getting a loan, or buying a car, what principles do you use? And I, I, I have my list of principles. They're very common. They're not necessarily earth-shattering, but it involves you know, respect the other side, uh, try to connect personally, use sense of humor, let the other side uh, save face, find ways that uh, you seek common ground, uh, don't blow up, don't uh, use the press in a negative way. Uh, find some kind of connection that allows you to keep the dialogue and the discussion going. The whole premise of my book is that even with the worst of our enemies, uh, the North Koreans, the Taliban, uh, you know, in those days, Fidel Castro, uh, Bashir uh, of uh, Sudan, considered the world's worst dictator by uh, Parade Magazine, has this annual vote. And it's either the North Koreans or Bashir of Sudan. Uh, Saddam Hussein, I went to head, head to head with him once and was able to, to succeed. So um, what are the principles and using these principles that, that I've used that, that I'd like to impart to, to the Institute of Politics? And again, uh, all of you here coming from the first state, the first primary, uh, I don't have to teach you anything about politics, but what I believe is essential in politics is a lot of it is personal. Voters will vote for you, not because they're impressed with your uh, policy papers or not that uh, you've got the best social media, the best TV ads, they want to look you in the eye, and if they like you and trust you, that's when they vote for you. And I was talking to Lou D'Alessandro earlier. A lot of it that I have found important is personal contact, one-on-one. -on -one. You know, finding a way through diplomacy that you can bring people together. Even if you have 
total differences in, in your philosophy or your way of life. Let me talk about uh, the issue of connecting and respect. And I will go to a negotiation that I had sometime in the late 90s before President Clinton appointed me as ambassador to the UN. I was a congressman, and I was always going around trying to uh, settle a lot of these uh, issues, get political prisoners out, find ways to seek common ground with the worst of regimes. And I went to the Sudan, where there were three Red Cross workers, an American, an Australian, and a French person. And my objective was to get them out of this rebel camp that this guy Carabino, who was fighting the government, uh, had kept them there. And the International Red Cross, the UN, Jimmy Carter, uh, Jesse Jackson, they'd all tried and, and, and couldn't get them out. And I remember going to see this rebel leader. I remember flying in. It was way in the internal parts of the Sudan that, that very few people ever get to. And I remember these little kids with their AK-47s as I stepped off the plane, and I, I immediately said, I want, don't, I, as one of those little bush pilots, don't leave, because I may be leaving a lot sooner. And so I went in, and I discussed with this guy, Carabino. He started out saying, I want $10 million. I said, forget it. You're not going to get that. Um, I want these three prisoners. And he'd say to me, you know, I've tried with the UN, uh, I, I don't succeed, I want, okay, five million bucks. I said, forget it, no money. All right, one million, one million. Because he had, over the last six months, he realized that the use of these hostages was, he didn't have a use for them anymore. He, he needed something in return. Uh, he'd maximize his leverage over them. And so, in talking to him, one of the things he said to me was, you know, one of the things I like about you is you haven't lectured me. You haven't told me how bad a person I am. You haven't called me a human rights violator. I said, no, I, I just want to get these three prisoners out. Um, you know, I'm a human being. You're a human being. Uh, what can we do to get them out? And so... I wasn't getting anywhere, two hours, three hours. The American ambassador was there. The Australian ambassador was there. We were in this rebel camp, all outdoors. And I said, well, let's, let's give me a tour of your camp. And we went around and got to the infirmary, the area where uh, I saw a lot of little kids there that were in beds. There was no medical equipment. And I learned from one of the nurses there, she whispered in my ear, Carabino's daughter, three months old, died yesterday. And so I knew that maybe that was a personal connection where I could say, look, you know, you've got no medical equipment, you've got no medicine. And I went to Carabino, we sat down again, and I said, look, I'm going to leave in two hours. I got to leave. I got to leave before the sun leaves, I, I got to get back to Khartoum. Let's find a way to, uh, let's find a way to make a deal right here. And so he says to me, um, million dollars. I said, no, but what I'll do is I'll bring you some doctors and some medicine and we'll find a way to prevent tragedies like your daughter's. And he looked at me, and this rebel leader that apparently was one of the world's worst killers in that region, I saw a little bit of a tear. And what it was was a personal connection that we made. And he said to me, okay, uh, you can have them, but I want something else. I said, oh, no, what is it now? He said, I want a Land Rover. <laughs> You know, he, he couldn't get around anywhere. And I said, well, is that, is that it? And he says, I want a Land Rover. And I said to myself, boy, uh, if I can't produce this Land Rover, I'm in deep trouble. So I said, if I call the head of the Red Cross and ask him for a Land Rover, he's going to say no. But I'll, I'll say to Carabino, okay, I'll do it. You got the Land Rover. 
but I get them right now, right this moment. So we got out. We landed in Geneva. The press was all over the place, you know, because we put the word out that we had the three. And I remember the head of the Red Cross, Conrado Samaruga, very distinguished Italian. And I said to him, Mr. Samaruga, I, I've got one little thing I got to tell you. Um, we got them out. They're all yours. And he was so oh, thankful. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I said, but you got to give him a Land Rover. And he looked at me. I thought he was going to kill me. I said, no, but it can be a used one. <laughs> anyway, he did deliver it, and we did get it done. But my point here was when I left, I thanked the leader of the Sudan, Bashir, because he helped. He sent one of his people with me because this uh, rebel leader was fighting him. And so we made a connection, and Bashir later, 12 years later, when I went back to the Sudan to try to get a Chicago Tribune reporter out, he actually mentioned that. He said, you know, you thanked me, you treated me with respect like you did Carabino, and, and I remembered that. And that's what is, I think, most fundamental, finding ways to, to connect to, to either culturally or in, in some fashion. Because 10 years later, I went back and Bashir had an American journalist. I mentioned the Chicago Tribune reporter and two of his aides in a prison in South Sudan. And people said, well, maybe Richardson can get him out. So I went to see Bashir in Khartoum. This was 12 years later, 10, 12 years later. And I remember saying to him, I said, you know, um, you're my friend. We don't agree much. I had an AP reporter there uh, covering the, the discussion. And, and he said to me, well, you treated me with respect. I understand you're going to run for president. You know, if you do, I'm for you. I said, oh, there goes my campaign. <laughs> In New Hampshire, I'm done. Uh, in Iowa, I'm done. And the reporter was taking, I was wondering when she was going to write that. But we had a long negotiation over this reporter. And finally, he said, you know, uh, you're an honorable man. Everybody has tried to get this reporter out, including Barack Obama, who was a senator, uh, including uh, everybody that has tried to negotiate uh, for this, the International Commission for Journalists. And what I will do, he says, because it's you, because you treated me with respect, I will give you this American reporter. I said, now, Mr. President, he's got two aides. They're from Mali. They need to come out, too. They're the ones that carry the, 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 the pictures, the, the equipment. Uh, they're the, you know, the, the staff. And they're in prison, too. And they're sick. And he said, oh, no, 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 you can't have them. They're enemies of Sudan. You know, they, they, they have tried to overthrow me, that country. I said, but these are two just assistants. Uh, and I gambled. And these two Malians, they're, they're black. You know, they're very tall. They're black, huge, but they were sick. And I had to get them out too. So then I said, I'm going to use a little humor here. I gambled and I said, look, Mr. President, you and I are politicians. You know, I, I just got reelected in New Mexico. I got 69%. And I said, you got, I see you got 98%. Did you have an opponent? And he, he looks at me. Are you insulting me? No, I'm kidding you. I said, and then he laughed. But he had no, he had no opponent. He, I don't know who, had, who got 2%, but he got 98%. And I said, you know, Mr. President, how can you let me get the white guy out, but the two blacks I can't get out? That would be poison for me. I got to get the blacks out. I used that. And he looked at me. And I thought he was either going to shoot me or I had no idea what he would do. He started laughing. 
and laughing and laughing. And he said, get them. You got them all. So that's how I, I got them out. So humor, respect, being straight, being honest. I mean, these are things that uh, you say, well, God, he's not teaching me anything. But this is something that, that worked. I'm going to talk to you about something that didn't work. It worked for me once in North Korea when I got two American pilots out uh, in the mid-90s, and I told the North Koreans that I would not leave, and this was around Christmas, until I got, one was a deceased pilot, the other was uh, another pilot who was detained. They were uh, over the DMZ, they got shot down, and I got the bluff of saying to them, I'm never going to leave. And one of the things that was working in my favor is every phone call was monitored. So when I would talk to Washington, at the time the Secretary of State was Warren Christopher, he was trying to get me to stay and negotiate and, and use this tactic. And, and I was saying, well, I'm not going to leave until they turn him over. And they were hearing that. You know, although I got to tell you, close to Christmas, I almost caved and said, I'm leaving. I'm getting out of here. But I finally got the two out. I finally got the two out by using that tactic. Now, I made a terrible mistake in Cuba years later. In fact, a couple of years ago. In fact, Caitlin Keller, did you, were you with me on that trip? She's on my uh, staff. She was on my staff. And I went and talked to, this was not Fidel Castro. I'd gotten some prisoners out from him. But, you know, he's kind of on the sidelines, and I was negotiating with a foreign minister for an American by the name of Alan Gross, who's still in prison. And the administration, I, I wasn't an envoy, but they had said, you know, if maybe we take Cuba off the terrorism list, uh, maybe if we do this, uh, they'll turn over Alan Gross. And I said, what if we... What if we get rid of uh, the ban on Cuban cigars? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, they weren't going to do that. But uh, so we met. And I thought we had a deal with the Cubans. And the Cubans said to me, no, you're not going to get Alan Gross. And instead of like not losing my cool, they said, you're not going to get Alan Gross. Furthermore, we're not going to let you see him. And lastly, we want you to leave. And I said, well, that's a very pleasant negotiation. So I was mad. And instead of not saying anything, keeping my cool, I went to the hotel, the Nacional Hotel, where there's a bunch of press there waiting. And instead of, like, not saying anything, I said, you know, the Cubans, this is a hostage. This is against international law. And I am not going to leave until I see Alan Gross. Well, one day passed, two days, three days, I left. I try to call a bluff and it didn't work. When you don't have uh, that equipment, uh, when you don't have that knowledge that your bluff is gonna work, uh, don't do it. And with the Cubans, at the time, I was no longer a governor. So, you know, I'd lost kind of my power base and, 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 and it was a mistake. And today, Alan Gross is still in prison. No, no one can get him out. And that's the main reason why the US and Cuba don't have stronger relations. Um, sense of humor, I think, is important. I mentioned uh, the Bashir issue. I mentioned with the North Koreans, uh, there was one negotiation uh, that uh, I remember entering. And, and, and they took me into a very somber room. And, and I sat down and I said to the North Korean, is this where you take people's fingernails off? Where is that? And they looked at me. And, and you know, the Asian is very, very formal. And I said, no, this has not worked. I, should I apologize? I didn't. And they actually, at the end of the discussion, they, they referred to that as saying, well, you know, I understand you were trying to uh, bring us together with your sense of humor. You never know whether it's going to work, but in that, it did. I'll close with Saddam Hussein, the toughest negotiation I had in, in, in the late 90s. Uh, this was a case where 
uh, everyone had tried to get two American contractors out. This was at the height of us uh, saying Saddam Hussein had the weapons of mass destruction. Uh, this was uh, at the height of the worst of our relationship. Uh, we were about to bomb uh, President, this was during President Clinton. This was before the invasion. And the relationship was very tense. And I had been negotiating with the UN ambassador. How do we get these Americans back? And we finally found a formula. The formula was the ambassador said, you've been persistent. You've been negotiating for six months. We have an agreement with Saddam Hussein's office that he will meet with you, and if you can persuade him, we will turn these American hostages over to you. The good news was that Saddam had had these hostages for close to nine months, and he wasn't able to find ways to, to get something in return from U.S., whether uh, relief of sanctions, whether some kind of statement by President Clinton. So I, the, my timing was good. So I went over and had this meeting with Saddam Hussein. And I remember vividly, uh, I was scared. I looked at the palms of my hand, I, it was sweating. And we sat in a small room, a chandelier's golden room. And, and I saw all of these shoes uh, around the curtains. These were the Iraqi National Guard uh, standing. Uh, they weren't hiding because I could see them. I could see their shoes, their boots gleaming boots. And Saddam Hussein walked in. He's a tall guy, you know, thin. Um, he had his weapons. He uh, sat down. We both sat down. He had these beady eyes, and he looked at me uh, with hatred. He, he looked at me as I said, I'm here on behalf of uh, a humanitarian mission. I want to get these two men out. Uh, Mr. President, I, I can't assure you that you're going to get anything in return, maybe one day a good press. Then I made a terrible mistake. I crossed my f feet and showed him the sole of my shoe, which to an Arab is a supreme insult. You can't do that because it's dirty. I had my briefing books. They said, do not, do not have any showing of your shoe to any Arab leader. And the first thing I did, I was tired. We'd driven all day from Jordan. Uh, a lot of these dictators, they, they have you meet them at night, like at midnight. Fidel Castro, I remember, we were there when I got some prisoners out. 2 a.m., I'm sleeping. President wants to see you. I said, at, at 2 o'clock, I said, well, that's great. Can I sleep? No, no, right now. So we went and met Castro and uh, banquet. He was having dinner. He was a night owl. He worked at night. Uh, back to Saddam Hussein. We found that uh, he was very upset when I crossed the sole of my shoe. He left. He left the room. And I said to myself, I'm done. What is going to happen? I had the interpreter. And the interpreter said, you must apologize. You've made a grievous error. And I looked at him and I said, you know, maybe I've fallen into something where they've set me up, but I had made the mistake. I said, well, is Saddam coming back? He said, yeah, he's coming back. But you must apologize. This is the, my translator, uh, an Iraqi. So Saddam came back and he sat down. He looked at me again with the beady eyes. And I said, should I apologize? Should I grovel? Should I like, I'm a Cretan? Uh, and I decided not to. I was very respectful. I said, you know, Mr. President, I, I'm trying to get these two Americans out. That's all I want to do. They want to be with their families. You've had them for months. Uh, time to let them go. And, and, and he got closer to me, looking at me, I think thinking, well, this guy either has guts or is the dumbest <laughs> human being in the world. And all of a sudden, he stepped back, and he said, you know, by virtue of uh, Section 14 of the Iraqi Constitution, I hereby turn over the two Americans to you, never looking at me. And I jumped like that to put my hand on him, basically to say, thanks. You did something good. Thank you. 
the Iraqi National Guard stormed out because they thought I was going to do something to him. He looked at me and he said, I'm going to have the press come in and we're going to take our picture together. And I want you to know, he said, that my having a picture with you, this is Saddam Hussein, is not going to be good in front of my country. And I said, well, Mr. President, my picture with you is not going to help me either. <laughs> and so the press came out. They took our pictures. The Americans came in. He had already decided to turn them over to me uh, for his own political reasons. And at the end of the discussion, we stood there. And I said, well, Mr. President, you did the, you did the right thing. Then he said to me, I understand that you made a request to go to Mass after your victory here. You're famous around the world, he said to me. I said, well, um, thank you for giving me the two prisoners. One of the things you learn when you're negotiating with a dictator, after you get something done, get out. Get out, because they change their mind. They're tempestuous. Get out. And I said, well, you know, Mr. President, I have to leave. Um, I, I must leave immediately because I'm missing votes in the Congress. If he had checked, we were on recess. <laughs> we weren't missing any votes. Um, but he said, I understand that uh, you want to go to a Chaldean Catholic service. You're a Roman Catholic. It's Sunday. Uh, I've arranged for Tariq Aziz, the foreign minister's wife, to take you to a service. And I said, Mr. President, I have to leave. I, I can't stay. And finally, uh, he said, no, you're going to have to go, or you can't go, because his car was the one taking us to Jordan, where we would get out of uh, the whole region. And so um, finally, I said, well, uh, of course I'll go. And, and then he looked at me and said, and by the way, I know you're in a rush, but don't go to confession. And I looked at him. He says, because if you go to confession, you're going to be there for a long time. <laughs> and I looked at him, a smile, a little smile. Anyway, that was my encounter with this guy. But it was a connection. It was humor. Um, you know, it was something that, that, that I'll always remember. And he did a good thing at that time. He was a horrendous man, you know. A, vicious killer of his own people. But for that uh, short moment, uh, I think the humanitarianism or his self-interest, he already felt he had these individuals long enough, he'd let them go. Anyway, um, I've gone for half an hour. I'd be very eager to take questions. I think uh, Mr. Levesque here is going to, or uh, anybody that has a question, about any of the issues. I didn't get to the Clinton-Obama stuff. I'll be glad to. But uh, again, uh, it's a, a delight to be here. Who's going to be first? Thank you very much for a most interesting and entertaining presentation. Uh, my question is, if you were going to negotiate with Putin today... With who? With uh, Putin, Vladimir. Yeah. How would you approach him? And how would you assess what, how President Obama is approaching him? Are we villainizing him to get what we want? Or please comment on that. You know, I, I, I think President Obama, on, on, with a Putin issue, has handled it as best as an American president can. Uh, here's my view. Um, I had met President Putin when he first came in. This was President Clinton taking his cabinet to Moscow, and Putin had just come in. We had this luncheon of uh, six cabinet members from the U.S. side, uh, six from the Russian side. And, and, and Putin was a total technocrat, but he was smart. I remember he knew all the issues. I talked to him about energy. He wouldn't let any of his cabinet members say a word. He would respond. But the substance was there. Uh, and, and I remember uh, President Clinton saying, this is a smart guy. Uh, this is in con Well, you know, we had had a cabinet meeting a year before with Yeltsin, 
who was like a fun-loving guy. I mean, we, we didn't get through the luncheon because Yeltsin had a few glasses of water. Um, and, but but with, uh, with Putin, you know, I think what has happened uh, is Russia looked at where they were today and needed something. It's not justified what they did, taking over Crimea and Ukraine. Uh, but I think they had looked at the last few years. This great empire had vanished almost 40% of it. If you look at uh, Azerbaijan, Ukraine, uh, Georgia, the Baltics, that was all theirs. Kurdistan, all the oil rich, and they lost it. For whatever reason, it was gone. And so Putin felt that in the Ukraine, with uh, the refusal of the president to join the EU and, and Russia basically hammering Ukraine and saying, unless you uh, stay with us and join the Russian Customs Union, we're going to squeeze you with your natural gas prices, that the Ukrainian president caved. And that created a situation where uh, Putin could go into Crimea and say it was his. Now, what can the U.S. do? I mean, we're not going to put troops there. One of the things that I think Pres uh, President Obama is in his mind is the American people, they're tired of wars. They're tired of Iraq, of Afghanistan, of our troops, PTSD, you know, all these huge commitments. Uh, and, and I think he's very cautious, understandably, about committing a huge American resources. No, what we can do with Putin is uh, two things. One, on the military side, I think it makes sense to strengthen NATO, strengthen the Baltics. Uh, I think it makes sense to have a new energy relationship that doesn't have those countries in Europe so dependent on Russia's natural gas. I would export natural gas, LNG terminals, with, with proper environmental standards on fracking. I think we can do that. Uh, so I would, through energy and through buttressing some of our defense ties with some of those countries, uh, and through diplomacy, I see Secretary Kerry's picture up there. I don't see him with Putin. I guess the, you haven't put that one up. But I know they met the Russian foreign minister who used to be the UN ambassador. Uh, they're talking about some kind of diplomatic solution. Um, so. I believe that the president's done the right thing. I mean, the, I, I, I know I see Senator McCain there. He says, well, you know, uh, he's because we're weak, he did that. I said, well, what do you mean? What, what's the connection there? Um, I, I believe that uh, Putin is, he's on a roll now. He's 78% popular in Russia. So, so that, so I think what, what we do is take these soft power steps that are important. Governor, thank you very much for being with us this evening, and thanks for coming to New Hampshire. I'm a student here at the college, and I was wondering, um, for a question, how does the United States negotiate with people that are both our allies, but also not our allies in the same sense? So, for example, someone like Hamid Karzai, who the United States is trying to negotiate a um, status of forces agreement with, um, where we may want to have some sort of you know, leftover force to deal with terrorism, in that region, but yet Karzai isn't necessarily willing to do that. So how would we kind of approach that situation where we're negotiating with someone who's a friend, but also at odds with us at the same time? Thank you. Excellent question. You know, the, the answer is the best thing that's going to happen is that Karzai is leaving. He no longer will be president. And so, you know, the relationship with Karzai has been so ex exhaustively bad. Uh, you know, it started out well, but then Karzai, I think, has lost confidence in us. We've lost confidence in Karzai. There's just a lot of corruption there. Um, he didn't even want to sign a security pact that basically said we will keep troops there. So the best thing that can happen is an election of a new president, and then we make the decision, do we keep troops there? You know, my view, I, I don't know how you feel, but I, I, I just, uh, I think the time has come when we've done all we can. Maybe a very small residual force, maybe some training, very small. But to, to commit our troops in this situation, you know, the Taliban, 
I negotiated with them too. This was in the uh, Clinton administration. I was the first cabinet member to talk to them. The Pakistanis arranged it. And here's another case when you think a negotiation is going wrong, don't give up because something may happen that's working well. With the Taliban, my objective was threefold. One, Osama bin Laden. They had him. Uh, this was before, uh, after he bombed some of the embassies, not 9-11, the embassy in, uh, in Kenya. And, and so I was sent to do three things. One, try to get a ceasefire with the Northern Alliance and the Taliban. Two, try to do something for women there, give them some voting rights. And three, um, tell them that we want Osama bin Laden. The first one, I didn't succeed. They said, well, you know, we'll take care of him. He'll be okay. I remember them saying that. The second was we did get a temporary ceasefire. And we did make some advances for girls, not for women at university. We did get that done. But in the course of the negotiation, I was talking to this Taliban leader, and you know we had our side. I was UN ambassador on their side. Uh, it was it was in in a circular uh, circular table, and all of a sudden this Taliban leader, you know they had sandals. He wasn't wearing shoes. Takes this big knife out and start starts cutting his toenails in the middle of the negotiation. And I said to my, you know, this was the deputy. I said, is he, is he stiffing me or should I continue? Why is he doing, is he showing terrible indifference? And, and no, it was his culture. It was his way of, you know, he wanted to show that he was calm. This is what he did. And we finally did work an agreement. But again, it's an example of, of you know, things don't look good. Don't give up. Just keep, keep going. But that's my Karzai answer. I know it's too long. Governor, thank you for, uh, for your speech and for all the work you've done. My question is a lot simpler. I'm really curious what you do when you are scared. How do you keep yourself projecting confidence and how do you keep your head in the game? Well, I know Saddam Hussein knew I was scared. All he had to do was look at my uh, hands. And, and my staffer, I had one, said, said that I was sweating, that I'd never done that before, but with him I had. Um, you know, sometimes my wife sometimes said, you know, I, I, I don't want you to, to keep doing this stuff. You know, I'd like, to, I'd like us eventually to to retire. By the way, now that I'm in the private sector, you know, I'm doing speeches, uh, little consulting boards. Um, I'm trying to, I have a little foundation where we're protecting elephants in Africa from poachers and ivory. Also with Robert Redford, um, I have a little foundation to protect wild horses from being slaughtered. The wild horses, not your, your horses that you have here. These are the ones out there. Um, my, my point, the reason I'm telling you this is that uh, I like the fact, I was telling, uh, telling some of my friends uh, here in New Hampshire, don't, don't bring the income tax back. Let's keep, it, keep it out. It's a good thing. Not to have a state income tax. I'm talk, I don't see much laughter. Anyway. <laughs> You're from where? But, but so you, you keep going. I mean, you, 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 you know, sometimes being like a U.S., sometimes I've represented the White House, the administration. Other times I haven't. I sometimes feel safer when I haven't, when I, I have my own security from the governor's office or uh, where, where I'm out there uh, as a citizen of the world. And my view is that diplomacy, out-of-the-box diplomacy, is important. It's just not governments. It's sports teams. I'm a great believer in sports diplomacy, although I see Dennis Rodman has taken my job as North Korea envoy. <laughs> you know, by the way, I did some TV. Whenever North Korea flares up, I mean, Caitlin here arranges my media, I get called as I'm the only guy that knows the North Koreans. But I say, you know, ask Rodman. I, the North Korean leader, I went there a year ago with uh, Eric Schmidt at Google. We try to get the internet in there. 
and he wouldn't see us, Kim Jong Un, not not at all. He stiffed us completely. But we we did stay there for four days. What do you do? You know, you stay calm. You, I've I've had experiences, but that Saddam Hussein, and that also with Carabino, and that in that patch of uh, the African wild. I, I, I was wondering if I was stretching my luck, and that's why probably I gave him the, the Land Rover right away. <laughs> Thank you for um, your um, comments, of course. Um, so I've one and a half questions. Um, one of them is um, the manner of diplomacy that you have often practiced is, um, would you say that it is perhaps not well understood by the public at large? And if this is true, would those media misperceptions, especially in certain quarters. Um, a, a lot of people, at least to me verbally, have expressed a lot of skepticism about that kind of diplomacy. I do not share that skepticism, but what I'm saying is what, if such a thing exists, what, like, should a solid diplomat like you do about it. Yeah. Well, you know, there have been times when the State Department is not happy about some of the pl diplomacy I've done. The last trip to North Korea, uh, the State Department spokesman, Eric Schmidt, and I went. And I felt I had to go because I'd been invited. I'd postponed this visit at the request of the State Department. George Bruno knows how the State Department are. You know, they're very formal. It's traditional. You got your pinstripe suit. No, I guess you don't have your suit, George. But it is very traditional. And we have to respect our diplomats. They're very good. They're, they know languages. They know the policy. But I think sometimes... Uh, out-of-the-box diplomacy, a, an unusual way of getting things done, especially uh, through different channels, uh, is good. I think Jimmy Carter has had some successful ventures. Jesse Jackson, uh, I, I've mentioned some myself. Uh, envoys from the Vatican. Uh, I think, for instance, I hope the Vatican gets involved in the situation in Venezuela, which nobody wants to touch. You know, it's like blowing up. Um, so. I think there has to be a balance. I never go without telling the State Department, hey, I'm going to North Korea. They may not like it, but I'm going. And I'm going to try to do this. I'm going to try to bring the internet there. I'm going to take Eric Schmidt from Google. This is serious. They said, well, we don't want to go because you'll give them a propaganda victory. No, the way they treated us, they, there was no propaganda victory. So I think there has to be a balance. Secondly, um, I do think that their private missions, church missions, and I encourage students uh, that, that go into countries where we have differences that can be very useful. You know, for years, we concentrated so much of our diplomatic, our intelligence corps with the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union no, no longer, when it f went down, was the place to be an expert. Then we turned to the Arab world. We didn't have enough Arab language experts, Arab students. Now it's tilting back to Russia. We don't have anybody that, well, we do. The, the, so you, you, you never know in diplomacy what is going to be needed. Now, what I say to young students, to you guys, one, uh, learn languages. Two, international relationships. Uh, Dan, uh, where's Bartlett? He introduced me. He did a good job. Even wore a New Mexico bolo tie. I love <laughs> Um, you know, stick to international relations, stick to trade, stick to languages. This is a good career. Public service is a good career. I know this is the Institute of Politics. I have one bit of advice for you students. If you said to me, I want to be in politics, what should I do? You know what I tell you? One word, run. Run for office. I don't care if you're 21. Run for county committee. Don't run against Lou because you'll lose. <laughs> but, but don't wait around. You know, politicians will say, hey, you know, uh, Wait your turn, son. Wait for 10 years and I'll leave office. 
you're getting tricked. Run then. Be aggressive, especially women. We need more women running for office. For coming out here tonight. Uh, my question is, uh, how do you think the world at large handled the Syria problem? Do you think there's anything more we could have gotten other than just the release of chemical weapons? Yeah, I, you know, I, uh, I remember, uh, you know, I'm not running in New Mexico anymore, uh, but I remember when the president said he was going to bomb Syria, I said, I'm for it. I'm for it because it's strategic, it's targeted, it's not continuous, no boots in the ground to help the humanitarian lanes. Um, I think it's the right choice. Um, then he changed his mind and said, well, we're going to go to the Congress. And it was obvious the Congress wasn't going to support it. Um, I think with Syria, the international community should have gotten in earlier. Uh, we should have provided more humanitarian aid. The UN should have done more. Uh, the problem, and I'm not going to blame Putin for everything, is that Russia props them up. They sell them weapons, they give them weapons, they give them political support, and, you know, that's huge in that region. Assad is terrible, uh, although I've had some Israeli friends say to me, well, you know, the, if, if the alternative, the rebels get in, it's going to be worse, so let's stick with Assad. I said, well, this is not official government Israelis, but those that know the region. Uh, my view is that uh, eventually bad people like him lose support and their own people take them out, either by an election or an Arab Spring or a coup. And, and that's what I think is going to happen to Assad. Now, now, what's your opinion? What do you think we should do? Right now. Good for you. Bartlett, what do you think? You're an international relations guy. What, what would you do in Syria? Stand up, stand up. <laughs> um, I believe right now in Syria, with the civil conflicts that are going on right now, there is a much more we can do as the gentleman spoke. And I believe as the civil conflicts move on and increase, I believe from a humanitarian perspective, any efforts that can be done to help the citizens of Syria should be taken. Um, okay. Uh, speaking on behalf of like the Assad regime, I think right now there's not much more we can do to help, you know, alleviate any conflicts and issues that we're having with the government. So. Very good. Very come up, come come up here. I want to do something. <laughs> now, I, have, I have no questions on domestic politics. It's incredible. Maybe the last one you'll ask. But one of the points that I made uh, to Lou and 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 to George Bruno who I saw today. This is, these are real political treasures you have here. Is that, you know, the Institute of Politics, I know Mr. Levesque is here. You know, you teach media training, uh, social media today is really important. Uh, you know, April uh, spring stuff, Facebook, Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I mean, I read it. I love to read. You don't need the CIA anymore. Everyone tells you what they're doing. <laughs> Today I'm going to, you know, have dinner here, and I feel this way. I, Caitlin does the, I don't post. When you, If you're thinking, I don't post myself. So if you think I did something foolish, she did it. But my point here is, if you read uh, a little bit of my bio, and I know you guys remember this, is one of the most proudest accomplishments I have is in the Guinness Book of World Records. Do you all know that I hold the world's handshaking record in a one eight hour period? It's in the Guinness Book of World Records. I shook the most hands. I beat Teddy Roosevelt, who shook 8,000 something hands on the boardwalk in New Jersey. And I broke the record in New Mexico. I shook 11,800 and so and so. What I'm trying to stress to you, Institute of Politics students and teachers, not the teachers, you know this, 
don't forget the personal side of politics. Don't forget the grassroots, the door to door. Going to somebody's home and asking for their vote. Or, or finding a way to communicate through personal contact what you stand for and what you want to do. Now I'm going to teach you all a trick that the master taught me, President Clinton, who's still mad at me because I endorsed Obama over his wife. So he's not happy with me, but that's besides the point. But he taught me one thing about politics, and that's how you shake a hand. It's so important. Remember this, especially the women that I want running. Okay. Tur turn around. I, I want your vote, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. At least smile. <laughs> okay, what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab your hand. I'm going to not kill your hand, but I'm also going to grab your elbow. And I'm going to bring you a little closer. And then I'm going to count. One, two, three. And what you're thinking is, that candidate really cares about me. <laughs> He's spending time listening to me. That's a trick that Clinton... If you ever shook this man's hand, I bet you thought that he only cares about me because he's what he has his gaze. But the key is to grab the elbow, bring it a little closer. One, two, three. You'll vote for me, right? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, with with George Bruno is his smile. He has this great smile. With, with Jim Demers, the guy is like, I remember when I first met him, he's like he, he knows everybody in the state, but that's through personal contact. D'Alessandro, I mean, when you're running and you're a presidential candidate, you get his endorsement. You're in good shape. And I remember, God, I thought, how am I going to get a lose vote? What, what do I need to do? And, 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 you know, it, it was grassroots. Was, I didn't get it, but I think I was second, Lou. Well, who knows? I think I got his daughter to like me. Okay, so we got, where's Mr. Levesque? Two more or one more? Let's do two more. Jimmy, go ahead. Uh, hearing what you just said, I, I want to want everyone here to know that one of the first days when I met you, um, you proved to a lot of people just what kind of schmoozer you are. You won the award, I think, as being the best schmoozer in 2008. But right here in Manchester, it was the St. Patrick's Day parade. And you decided you were going to shake every single person's hand that lined the route. It was a 45-minute parade that took seven hours that day. And I remember one family saying, they're lining up for the Christmas parade already. What, what happened here? But I, I think that the people of New Hampshire, while you might not have won the New Hampshire primary, you added a tremendous uh, amount of knowledge. And really, you demonstrated what the New Hampshire primary is all about. And you made our primary a better primary by being a candidate. So I, I want to say first, thank you for being part of the New Hampshire primary because you were a key part of it. Well, that's so nice, Jim. And I, I'll tell you two quick stories <clears throat> in that primary. The first was that morning that I arrived, I went to your famous rest Puritans, you know, to get to shake some hands. And I went over, I remember going over, and, and, and there's a booth, you know, they're all booths. Everybody's eating. They don't want to be bothered. So I went up, and I'm Bill Richardson. I'm running for president. This guy says, yeah, uh, we were just laughing about it. <laughs> anyway, anyway, that's Mo Udall's line. That is not a truth. That, that happened to Mo Udall. The second, Jim, is I made a terrible mistake in that parade, even though I shook hundreds of hands. You helped me get in the parade. But so did the mayor of Manchester. His name was Craig, Jim Craig. Was he mayor? He was a state rep. He was a state, state rep, yeah. anyway. Running the primary for Congress. Yeah, well, that, that's the story. I, so I, I was really grateful to Craig. I said, you know, what, what can I do for you? And he said, well, can you endorse me for Congress? I said, sure. So I endorse him for Congress. Guess who he's right? Carol Shea Porter, who beats him. And Carol Shea Porter still remembers that. <laughs> So that's one thing. In primaries, be careful. 
you know, take a stand, but don't, you know, talk to Lou and talk to Jim and talk to Bruno before you, you endorse somebody. But be careful because politics is very personal. You know, you're choosing somebody over the other. At the same time that you're getting votes, the most exhilarating moment is in an election day when you see people voting for you. You see numbers. Jeez, 3,000, 6,000 people voted for me? My God, you feel so good. But, but be careful about, you know, getting into primaries when you don't know all the facts. And I was desperate to do well in New Hampshire. This guy is state rep. He, well, Jim, you helped me get into that parade. Remember that? Yeah. But, but, but you know, endorsing it didn't, didn't help me with Carol, who, you know, who's, she's a congresswoman. So be careful. So, okay, but that, I, that led to me, like, my question. So what, other than those two memories, what, what do you remember the most? And what do you like the most about having campaigned here in New Hampshire? What I like the most is the grassroots nature of this election in New Hampshire. Number two, I like the fact that New Hampshire voters know the issues, know what they're talking about. I remember talking to one New Hampshire voter in Nashua who said to me, well, you know, Governor, I got to tell you, uh, before I endorse you, this guy was a big vote getter. We need to visit three times. I said, Jesus, I've already done once. The primary is two weeks away. But, but you know, the the... The, the, the deep knowledge about issues and the fact that New Hampshireites, you guys know that you could elect the president. You know, you boost somebody all of a sudden, man, that person, that woman, that Republican, that Democrat might be president. So uh, what else do I remember? I remember how good people were to me and my wife, uh, Barbara. She went to Colby uh, Junior College and she, uh, she got me some votes there. She got me four votes. We had 11 total. No. No, I actually was fourth. There was, how many votes? We, we were fourth, respectable fourth, weren't we? we although I, I will say John Edwards beat me. But we had, uh, we had a good organization. Um, what else do I remember? I mean, the issues are important. You guys, oh, I, I guess the last thing, history and tradition. I can't remember your Secretary of State, Jim. Yeah. I remember going up there and, you know, I had to file presidential candidate. And, and I said to him, I said, you know, I just got back from Iowa. They're thinking of moving their primary up. Uh, what are you going to do? You know what he said? He said, for New Hampshire to be first, I will move it to Christmas. <laughs> I mean, so this deep sense of history. Is he still Secretary of State? This guy will never lose, I mean, with, with, with a view like that. So that's what I, that's what I remember. And, and I remember people like Bruno, people that took a stand for me. Uh, he'd been appointed ambassador by the Clintons, you know, and he, he went with me. He regrets it ever since. <laughs> but uh, that's what you remember. Uh, you remember the people and the supporters. I remember your family. I remember going to your house, the, the little town meetings at people's homes. So traditional, so New England, so issues oriented, where you're grilled. You're not, you know, you can't just leave and, 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 and depart. But in the book, you know, I talk about this endorsement that I made of Obama over Clinton. And I, I, I stand by that endorsement, but I didn't do the right thing. At the time, I didn't handle it the right way. I did the right thing. Bill Clinton wanted to come see me. I dropped out of New Hampshire. And so everyone was calling me about endorsements. And he called, and Hillary called, and Obama would call. I'd remember Obama. He'd call himself. Uh, Hillary would have his, her staff call. Will you hold for Senator Clinton? Obama would call, and he'd say, hey, Richardson, it's Obama. I said, Mr. President? You gonna make it? He said, I'm gonna win. And I said, okay, well, let's, let's talk. So I ended up endorsing him, but the mistake that I made was Bill Clinton wanted to come see me in Santa Fe at the Super Bowl with all the media, and he wanted to get my endorsement at halftime. And I didn't do it. I, I, I was undecided. And then in the end, I ended up uh, endorsing Obama. 
But there was also another instance where, where I liked uh, Obama. And I, I liked Hillary. I'd worked in the administration. I liked Clinton. I liked serving him. Uh, but I remember in one of the debates, you remember some of those debates? It wasn't the New Hampshire one. By the way, I won that debate. Of course, I, was, I made that decision. Uh, that was supposed to be funny. That was, <laughs> Chris, how come they're not laughing? Huh? It wasn't funny? Anyway, so what, 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 I, what I did was, this was this debate. I think it was the third debate at Drexel University. You guys don't remember. This is like eight years ago. But you'll see the debates that will happen in the next cycle. But this was a debate at Drexel. And, and I, was, I was here towards the end. Obama was at the end. They put the minorities at the end, you know, <laughs> Hispanic, African American. And so they, it was really a two-person debate, Obama versus Clinton. The rest of us, who cared? Wolf Blitzer, I think, was asking a question. And so I'm sitting next to Obama, and we're talking. We, we had sort of become friends. You know, we'd say, can you believe that so-and-so said this? Come on. And Obama would say, yeah, I can't believe it. He said it this way. So we were gossiping. We, we, <laughs> then all of a sudden, Wolf Blitzer says, and Governor Richardson, what's your position on our Homeland Security policy. I said, I can't believe it. I, I've been asked a question. Maybe <laughs> the polls are moving my way. And so I answered, you know, blah, 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 point one, point two, point three. Whew. So I go back to gossiping with them. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, Blitzer says, and Governor Richardson, what do you think of that? I look at Obama. I wasn't listening. I was talking to Obama. <laughs> and he whispers, they asked you about Katrina. Katrina. My view on Katrina is. <laughs> so he didn't throw me on the, under the bus. And I liked that. And I said, well, thanks, Obama. He says, don't mention it. Don't forget it. <laughs> but anyway, that, you know, you get into those stories. One more? Do we do one more? Or that's it? These people are tired. I can tell. That's another thing about a good poly. You can tell when people are tired. They, they've had it. All right, come on. Let's finish this. Well, for everyone here tonight, I want to thank you for coming to New Hampshire and for your discussion. I'm glad you enjoyed my bolo tie. Um, so on behalf of everyone here at the New Hampshire Institute of Politics and St. Anthony College, we'd like to give you this gift. Thank you. Thank you very no. much.